Father, Lord, we can thank you for today. Thank you so much for everything that you've given us. Be with us now as we open your word. Uh, Father, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's good to have you with us this morning. It's good to have you as a member of our church tuning in. And for those of you who are guests, thank you for coming to be with us. We're looking forward to the day when we can gather together in community and worship our Heavenly Father together. And we're looking at next month on the 14th of opening up our church for that. We will have two services. One service will be at 9 o'clock. The second service will be at 1045. And we want to encourage you to come and be with us. I know some churches will be starting on the 7th, but we will be starting on the 14th and looking forward to that. We put a lot of precautions in place, a lot of things to keep you safe as you come and worship with us, and we'll talk more about that later. But I am glad to have you with us. Memorial Day. That's what tomorrow is. A day when we remember folks who have fought in battles for our country, for the freedoms that we enjoy here even today. Memorial Day. A lot of people have been injured. A lot of people have been killed because of these battles. Your son, your husband, your wife, mother, whatever it is, we thank you that you're willing to give your family in service to our country. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you for Memorial Day. We thank you for what it stands for. We live in a society today that doesn't think much about it. It's a day of picnics, a day of going to the beaches, the day to take a day off, and kids are out of school, and everything but what it was meant to be. And I pray that even though we might have those exercises, those events in planning for today, that we might stop and think about those who have given their lives. We pray that you might be with us this morning and guide us and direct us and thank you for this time that we can share together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I think that as you can see down in the bottom right-hand corner, that uh, or left-hand corner for you, but I want to talk to you about a, a thought about being lost. I'm lost. We've been able to do well with our living. We've done well for what God has done for us. And he's opened up so many ways of guiding and directing us. But when it comes to the physical part, that is the part that we take in traveling somewhere, sometimes we have problems and difficulties getting there. We've all been lost at one time or another. I mean, we've been really lost. I've been lost more than I want to admit. I'm taking, talking about the days before GPS, of course. I remember when Claudia, my son Bill, and I lived in Kansas City, Missouri. It was evening, and we didn't belong in the part of town that we were in. There were guns and killings almost every night in that particular area of Kansas City. We were in the wrong place, and we were definitely lost. I can remember how I felt being lost and being in the wrong place. 
I'm sure that my blood pressure had gone way up. My stomach was in knots. My nerves were in a mess and I recognized we were where we are in this place and I didn't recognize anything. I was concerned for my family. Daniel Boone, the great American hero, explorer, soldier, and many more things said he never lost, but he did admit to being mighty disoriented for several days in a row. Do you know the psychologists call people who get lost a lot, even though they aren't brain damaged or have cognitive impairment? They're called people who get lost all the time. Lost people don't get lost easily because they easily remember landmarks and they remember distances between certain places. This isn't easy for me to admit. My nickname was Pathfinder Elias. I got this nickname from my dad who had the same problem I had. And I inherited his problem, and that is not one of us was good at directions or getting from one place to the next that we've never been at before. In Luke chapter 15, it is a chapter that speaks about lost things, and they're in the form of a parable. Sheep, lost coins, a lost son. This evening I want to talk to you a little bit about the lost son. We often call him the prodigal son. However, there's a different kind of loss that can happen in someone's life that is much more difficult to travel through and has far greater effects upon our lives. In Luke 15, Jesus was confronted by the religious leaders of the day because he was caught in the company of sinners part of what they called a no-no culture. Jesus answered them with these three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. I see this as a picture of God's heart to those who were religious, but they had absolutely no relationship to God. The thing I want you to see is, first of all, this parable about the lost son. That's where we will be this morning. It begins in verse 11 of Luke chapter 15 and goes through verse 31. I'm not going to read all of that this morning, but we will take a look at those verses from time to time. I found this parable to be pretty rough as I read it. This journey the young man took changed everything for him. But you see, it did not just affect him, it affected his father and it affected his brother. You know, so often we do things in our lives and we don't think about those around us that would be affected by the choices and the decisions that we make. And that's where we are with this one this morning. Think about your family members, your neighbors, your friends. From what you know about their lives and what you understand about the gospel and who Jesus is, would you consider some, if not all, of those people are lost and without Christ? Well, perhaps I should start at the beginning. Are you lost? In other words, if you were to die right now, where would you spend eternity? Would that be heaven or would that be hell? This requires you to be very honest with yourself. And another question for you is this. When did this lost son become lost? He was lost the instant he was born. We're born with the sin nature that comes to us from Adam and Eve when they chose to take the fruit of that tree. We are lost because we are unwilling to acknowledge what Jesus did at Calvary's cross. We just celebrated Easter a few weeks ago. He rose from that grave, and he's alive and well at the right hand of our Heavenly Father right now. There's a story about a young man who checked out a book from a Baltimore library. Sixty-five years passed, and the book was returned with a letter from the man. His name was John J. Wolfe. He lived in St. Louis. 
Wolf said in his letter that in 1946 he was a soldier recovering in Fort Meade after surgery when he visited that library. Wolf is expected to be shipped out to the Far East in just a couple of weeks. So he checked out the book called Sound and Symbol. It was in Chinese and it had, it had English sentences in it as well so that an English person could understand what was, what was being said. And he took that to prepare himself for the time he would spend in China. Sixty-five years later, Wolf found the book in his private library and decided to go back to Baltimore. The book was in the same great condition it was 16, uh, five, 65 years earlier. And it even found the original date on that book. Normally the maximum five would have been $65. $1 for each year that it was late. But the librarian heard his, heard his story and decided to waive that fee. You know, that's a picture of what the Lord Jesus has done. You see, salvation is free to you. You don't have to do anything. He did it all for you at Calvary's cross. But it doesn't mean that it wasn't expensive. He had to give his life. He had to die. He had to shed his blood because it's that blood that Jesus shed that will take away your sin. And it's powerful blood that God accepted as the only sacrifice for sin. That's the picture of what Jesus did for you and me. The problem in this story of the lost son is a matter of choice. What you choose to do, and this young man chose wrong. Folks, the choices and the decisions that we make today have consequences tomorrow. And the problem is we don't often look at tomorrow. We often find that we are in the wrong place at the wrong time because of the choices that we make. To the son, the decision he was making seemed to him to be all right at that particular moment. But you see, it's more than that. He thought he had made a choice that was good. Why not start fresh, he thought. Why not start new and make a name for myself? And the boy was interested only in himself. I want to, you to take your Bibles or your, your tablet or your phone, and I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read just a few verses that will put this into context. Starting chapter 15 and verse 11, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. This was not an unusual thing to be done in those days. When the older son wanted to get away from the family and get out on his own, do what he wanted to do, it was usually the father then would partition off certain parts of his estate and give it to his son. So this is not an unusual and uh, we find that, that uh, he divided his property between them, that is, the two boys. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. You see, he was living for the moment. He was living just for the day and he was not concerned about tomorrow. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a, to a citizen of that country who sent him to feed in the field to feed pigs. Now again, we need to understand for a Jewish boy to go out and feed pigs was an awful thing to him to do. And yet that was his job. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen in that country. He longed to fill his stomach with the pies that the pigs were eating, but not one gave him anything. You see, he was hungry, and he was feeding the pigs, but he himself had nothing to eat. 
when he came to his senses, you know, in your Bibles or whatever you're reading, if you can underline, if you can uh, have a mark on there that speaks about this word senses, he came to his senses. You know, sometimes we do things and we think nothing about how it affects anyone else. And then all of a sudden something happens and we come to our senses and realize what we have done. What we've done is wrong. And this is what happened to this boy. And he said here, when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. He went back home. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for his son. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. In verse uh, 22, but the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put the ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fat calf and, and kill it and let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The young man came to his senses and he thought, I'm in famine here. I have nothing to eat. I'm going to go back to my dad. And I'm going to tell him that I'm no more worthy of being a son. Just make me a servant. And he went back. And his father, just a long way off, was still able to recognize his son. And what his son was doing and was coming back. And his father was filled with joy. This is a picture of Jesus Christ. This is a picture of our Heavenly Father. You see, even a long way off, he recognizes those who come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. And that's what happened here with this boy. He came back and his father did everything to celebrate the coming back of his son. The boy was interested only in himself, but that changed. He failed to see what the decision he made would have consequences even months later. This is the struggle that a lot of people have when it comes to evaluating ourselves. In verse 17, I've already emphasized it, when he came to his senses. Let me ask you this morning, if you were to die right now, and you had a choice of either going to heaven or going to hell, where would you like to go? I'm sure that everybody would like to go to heaven. But there's a way that you can get to heaven. There are not a hundred different ways, not a lot of different roads that you can take to get to heaven. There's but one, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ as your, as your Savior. You see, He is the only one that paid the price for your sin. And all God asks you and me is to come in Him, acknowledge that you're a sinner. Acknowledge that you're undone and without hope. And ask the Lord to forgive you of your sin and to come into your heart and to save you from yourself. You see, it requires taking words uh, that are words of commitment. Father, I have sinned. Acknowledging that and coming to know Christ as your Savior. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's no other way, folks. It's not a matter of being a member of this church. It's not a matter of being a good person. It's not a matter of praying every day. It's not a matter of going to any church all the time. That doesn't change the fact that you're a sinner in need of salvation in need of Jesus Christ as your Savior. You see, we have choices. We can either acknowledge Christ as our Savior, 
Oh, we can say, well, that's rubbish. That, that doesn't concern me. One day it will. There are consequences to the kind of choices and decisions that we make and we face. Salvation, my friend, is so important. Salvation is the only answer to the consequence of where you will spend eternity. Let's pray. Now, Father, we thank you for being an awesome God. We thank you for your love. We thank you for our Savior. And Father, we thank you for this parable that you gave us about the lost son. And Lord, he had lost him more. One day those who trusted in Christ will be in heaven and will get to see that prodigal son face to face. And Father, what a great reunion that will be in heaven. And we want to thank you for it. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We want to encourage you to also be with us on Wednesday evenings. We have a Bible study that starts at 6.30, and it's on Zoom. And if you're unfamiliar with it, it's going to take a password. It's going to take a special number. And if you're interested in being part of that Bible study, which is in the book of Acts, by the way, call the church. And our secretary, uh, Kathleen, will be able to give you the number and also that password. So you can get in and you can study along with us. Again, thank you so much for being here with us. The Lord bless you real good.